This will be an abbreviated run through of anti-epileptic pharmacology. Um, for those of you that were present for the intern resident rounds, a lot of this will be the same. The biggest difference is when it's just text on the screen, I'm not going to read that. I'll just give you time to where you can pause it to read through that information. So to get started, again, these are the objectives, and most of this information is going to come from the International Veterinary Epileptic Task Force papers. Again, these are in my shared folder and also available through PubMed. As far as the definition of a seizure, again, it's excessive synchronous activity of the neurons themselves. For our action potential, um, again, some of the key players are going to be the cytoskeleton, the vesicle itself containing the neurotransmitters. In this case, it'll be glutamate. Um, syn synapsin, which attaches the vesicle to the cytoskeleton. RAB2A GTP complex, calmodulin, CAMK2, the snare proteins, and the calcium channels. When an action potential occurs, the end result is going to be opening of the calcium channels. One of the things calcium can do is bind to calmodulin. This activates the CAMK2, which then phosphorylates synapsin. Once phosphorylated, the vesicle will detach from the cytoskeleton, bind to the RAB2A GTP complex, which serves as a chaperone to bring the vesicle down to the snare proteins, at which point it is docked. After docking, the calcium can then bind to synaptotagmin, and this causes fusion of the vesicle to the terminal. And once fused to the terminal, it's then allowed to release the neurotransmitter, in this case, glutamate. As far as some of the key players in the action potential, you have sodium, whose inert's potential is 55, chloride, which is negative 65, and potassium, which is negative 90. As far as the choice of antiepileptic therapy, there's no official guidelines for that. Um, so I'll just state the evidence and as far as why we make the recommendations that we do. So this is a list of the long-acting antiepileptics, the ones that we'll focus on that are used more commonly in veterinary medicine, and then the fast-acting antiepileptics. This is some information on primidone. Again, primidone is not used very much anymore in veterinary medicine because of the side effects associated with it. For phenobarbital, it is a barbiturate. So barbiturates are going to work on the GABA-A receptor. So GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And when GABA binds to GABA-A, it opens chloride channels. And if you recall back to the NERTS potential, chlorides is negative 65, and the resting membrane potential is about negative 70. In order for threshold to be reached, it has to hit about negative 55 millivolts, or about 15 millivolts higher than what resting membrane potential is. Once threshold is reached, the action potential will occur, but if more chloride channels are open, it's harder to actually reach threshold. The way that barbiturates work is by binding to the barbiturate receptor on GABA-A, which prolongs the activity of GABA. At high enough dosages, barbiturates can actually activate the GABA channels themselves and inhibit the NMDA receptors. Benzodiazepines work on a different part of GABA-A. And their mechanism of action is to increase the affinity of GABA to GABA-A. So just a quick run through as far as the mechanism of actions of the fast-acting antiepileptics. Recall that this is mainly for the benzodiazepines. Propofol attaches to a different receptor to where it actually activates GABA-A and inhibits NMDA receptors. As far as the efficacy of phenobarbital, about 75% of patients will respond to it. 
has a therapeutic range of 25 to 35 micrograms per deciliter. The therapeutic range as listed Pharmacokinetics and then some of the interactions. These are drugs that are going to be metabolized by the liver and thus induction of the cytochrome P450 system will have effects on these medications along with levothyroxine which is why some patients on phenobarbital will actually become hypothyroid. There's a number of side effects associated with phenobarbital, which are usually dose dependent, but there are certain idiosyncratic reactions. To run through some of the more common ones, this is a paper discussing the hematological abnormalities. In this paper, there was an overall 4% prevalence of the hematologic abnormalities, with pancytopenia being the most common. For patients with superficial necrolytic dermatitis, also known as hepatocutaneous syndrome, the lesions typically occur that occur look like this, which is mainly the hyperkeratosis, and then it can affect the mucocutaneous junctions, and then there's concurrent hepatic abnormality. Most patients do not survive that this occurs with, but supplementing with amino acids could potentially help overall prognosis and survival. As far as the ultrasonographic finding, so monitoring patients on phenobarbital, usually check blood levels, biochemistry, and CBC at two weeks, three months, and six months. Every time you change the dose, this whole process will repeat. For monitoring, you can do cross-multiplication as far as figuring out what your new dose should be. So whatever your current dose is, multiply that by the drug level you want it to be, then divide by the current drug level, and that will give you what your new drug dose should be. For patients that have a short half-life of phenobarbital less than every 20 hours, this is a paper that discusses potentially giving phenobarbital every 8 hours. The equation for calculating the half-life and their findings of the study. So mepitoin is a newer antiepileptic that also works through the GABA-A channel, but it binds to the benzodiazepine receptor of it, again increasing the affinity of GABA to GABA-A. There could potentially be synergistic effects for patients that are on phenobarbital. This paper discusses the clinical efficacy and safety. The drug appears to be very safe most side effects resolving after about two weeks of starting the medication. The standard dose is 30 mg per kg, so a 90 mg per kg twice a day dose still appeared safe in patients. And then pharmacokinetic interactions and adverse reactions. Although it binds to the benzodiazepine receptor, benzos have a much higher affinity for the binding site. The license in the United States will be for fear and anxiety. Potassium bromide is a halogen, or I should say bromine is, along with chlorine. And when they're combined with anything on the first column, it will create a salt. Bromide also works through the GABA receptor, but it works differently because it'll actually flow through the GABA-A channels 
the end result will be the same as if there was an increased flow of, of chloride. For reasons we don't fully understand, bromide is able to travel through the GABA-A channels more readily than chloride. And there can be synergistic effects with phenobarbital. This is the efficacy of potassium bromide along with idiosyncratic reactions. Pharmacokinetics. And then the pharmacokinetic interactions. For dosing and monitoring, this is what is available for potassium bromide. If a patient is on phenobarbital, try to get the drug level closer to one milligram per mil. For those not on phenobarbital, closer to about two to two and a half mil per mil. For Keppra, again, running through our action potential, once the sodium channels are open, eventually it'll open the calcium channels, which bind to calmodulin, activating the CAMK2, which will then phosphorylate the vesicle. Once phosphorylated, it will attach the rab 2 gpp complex for it to be docked. Once docked, the calcium can then bind to synaptotagmin, which will cause fusion of the vesicle to the terminal, which will allow release of the neurotransmitter. Another protein on the vesicle not previously discussed is called SV2A. We don't understand the full function of SV2A, but we do know if Kepra binds to it, it will change the conformation of synaptotagmin, making it more difficult for calcium to bind to it. Kepra also has some effect on the presynaptic L calcium channels, making it more difficult for calcium to actually enter into the neuron itself. However, the main effect is thought to be on the SV2A based on studies done in knockout mice. This is information on the efficacy. It seems to be effective as an add-on medication or for structural epilepsy, but not for idiopathic epilepsy. It's readily bioavailable when given orally. with sedation being the most common side effect. Typical dosing is 60 mg per kg loading. Maintenance dose is listed, and you can send out drug levels. We don't know what the levels should actually be in dogs. The one time that it seems to be helpful are in patients with renal failure. For zonisamide, the mechanism, mechanism of action is mainly through delaying closure of the voltage-gated sodium channels. So when zonisamide is bound to the voltage-gated sodium channels, the initial action potential can occur like normal, but because of that delayed closure, the next sodium cannot enter to cause the next action potential to occur. It does also bind to the um, n-type calcium channels in the postsynaptic neuron. And then topiramate, which is very similar to zonisamide, has a very similar mechanism of action, but it binds to the L-type calcium channels. I actually misspoke. For zonisamide, it's the T-calcium channels. L-type for topiramate, and Kepra is the N-type. So if I most misspoke earlier for Kepra, that's a correction on it. This is the pharmacokinetics. And then the efficacy. Due to the small numbers of the study, zonisamide cannot be recommended as a primary or add-on anti-epileptic based on the recommendations of the International Epileptic Task Force.
Side effects are uncommon, but this is what has been reported. And because it is sulfa, idiosyncratic reactions are possible, although the only one that's been reported in dogs is acute hepatic toxicity. This is the dosing, and it needs to be doubled if they're on phenobarbital. For gabapentin, it is thought to bind to the alpha-2 delta-1 subunit, which causes a downregulation of the presynaptic calcium channels, meaning that when an action potential occurs, the amount of calcium that enters into the neuron will be decreased. Because of its similar conformation to GABA, it does bind to GABA transaminase as well, which is needed for breakdown of GABA. So if gabapentin is bound to it and GABA cannot be broken down, then there's going to be an excess buildup of, of GABA. This is thought to be the reason why sedation occurs, but there is some thought it might help as far as the anti-seizure effect as well. This is the pharmacokinetic information on GABA. The take home from this is that doubling the dose is not going to double the plasma level as it's only absorbed in the duodenum by the L-amino acid transporter. It seems to be a safe drug, but as far as its use in seizures, there's not a lot of information out there on it. As far as CATS, this information comes from this study, which was published in 2016. A lot of the side effects with phenobarbital are the same, but it should be noted that the liver changes are far less common in cats than dogs. So if you have a cat that has liver abnormalities while on phenobarbital, it's worth investigation. Don't use potassium bromide in cats. Bromide does have some effect on the bronchial secretion because of its influence on chloride movement in the body and thereby altering mucociliary function, which seems to occur much more commonly in cats than in dogs. A lot of these cats will develop a eosinophilic pneumonitis or some form of asthma when they're on potassium bromide. It's usually initially at the start of the use of bromide. So if a patient presents to you on potassium bromide, they've been on it for months or years. As long as it doesn't seem to be a side effect of the bromide, it should be safe to continue therapy with it. Levetiracetam appears safer, I'm sorry, more effective in cats than in dogs, but it still has to be given three times a day. And amepitoin does not appear as effective in cats as it does in dogs. So as far as the guidelines, it seems that phenobarbital overall is the most effective with amepitoin being the safest. A way to think about giving these medications is if you have a cat who you need to start therapy on. If an owner can give a medication three times a day, levetiracetam might be the safest and more effective than amepitoin. If they can only give a medication once or twice a day, then probably start with phenobarbital.